Imagine you're floating out in space, really far away from everything else. Except there's a big planet nearby. It's a sphere, as planets tend to be, and let's assume it's spherically symmetric throughout. That means that the density at a given radius is the same, but different radii might have different densities. The planet's mass pulls on you through the force of gravity, and if you've taken physics before, you probably learned to calculate this force using Newton's famous inverse square law. The magnitude is proportional to the planet's total mass, and it points toward the center. If this equation is really true though, it means that the force you feel is exactly the same, whether the planet looks like this, or whether we shrink the whole thing down to the point at its center. That's weird, isn't it? Doesn't it feel like there should be a difference? In this case, all parts of the planet are actually at the center, the same distance away from you. But when we do this, now they're all spread out. Some parts are closer, some are farther. And aren't they pulling in different directions? Well, they might be. But it turns out there's actually no difference at all as far as gravity is concerned. And this isn't just something unique about planets. Any spherically symmetric mass distribution has this property. Meaning if the sun suddenly shrank to a point, keeping its mass, all the planets would just keep going happily around their orbits as if nothing had changed. Of course, it would be weird to see the sun in the sky as a point of light without any extent, but it would continue rising and setting just like always. Isaac Newton called this miraculous fact Proposition 71, and he proved it back in the late 1600s. Despite the lackluster name though, even he was apparently surprised by it. This is one of those things that once you learn it, before long you start to have the feeling of, yeah, well, of course, I mean, what else could it be? But Newton's superb theorem is surprising, or better yet, against common sense, as Chandrasekhar put it. I mean, I can sort of believe it if I think about the extreme case. Imagine you go really far away from the planet. From out here, it might as well just be a point anyway, so sure, the force better be aimed in that direction. The force also becomes so small at this distance that we kind of stop caring about it anyway. But close up is another story. Is Newton really telling me that if I add up all the contributions to the force from all the little pieces of the planet, each with its own magnitude and direction, they conspire in the perfect way to act as if they were all stacked together at the center? Well, yes, apparently, that's what he's saying. How can we make sense of this? If you happen to know calculus, you can essentially go straight to the answer using something called Gauss's Law. This gives a very elegant proof to be sure, and it's how I learned it first in school. If you haven't done calculus though, Gauss's Law won't be much help. There's a lot hidden behind these compact equations. So I'd like to walk you through a different sort of argument that's simpler than Newton's original geometric proof, and also doesn't require calculus. The idea comes from Christoph Schmidt, and it's laid out nicely in this paper. I'm not gonna lie, there are some concepts involved that I would call calculus adjacent, but you don't really need to know anything ahead of time beyond a little trigonometry. And I think it's really cool that we can still learn new things about old problems like this. It certainly gave me a new and satisfying way of seeing it. To start off, what I like about this problem is that you can get pretty far just by thinking about the symmetry. For example, Without doing any calculations, you can figure out that the total force must be pointing toward the center of the planet, no matter where you are. To see that, let's start by cutting up our planet in a clever way. Like an onion, you can think of a sphere as a large number of very thin concentric shells. And because of the symmetry, if we can prove the superb theorem for just one of these shells, that's just as good as proving it for the whole filled out sphere. Pause for a second if you need to think about why that should be true. So our problem is already simpler. We just need to worry about a single shell of the mass. Now, imagine the force coming from one little piece of the shell. The idea here is that for any point you pick, there's always another point on the shell, the same distance away, at the opposite side of a circle, whose plane is perpendicular to the line connecting you and the center of the shell. The combined force due to both of these points we can get just by vector addition. And because they lie symmetrically on a cone this way, the sum has to point toward the center of the shell. Pick any other point, and you can play the same game. So the gravitational pull of a spherical shell is purely radial, and the same must be true for the whole filled out sphere. 
This is great. We're halfway there and we haven't even broken a sweat. The other thing to notice is that at a given distance r from the center, the magnitude is the same. Again, thanks to the symmetry. What we still don't know though is how strong the force should be. To figure that part out, let's stick with just proving it for one of our spherical shells again. Remember, we're trying to show now that the magnitude of the force is the same as if you concentrated all of the shell's mass into the point at its center. While we're at it, let's use Newton's second law of motion and just ask what acceleration you experience instead of what force. We'll call it g for gravity, and this saves us from having to carry around factors of your mass everywhere. Following Schmidt's argument, we're going to solve this problem by actually solving a different but equivalent problem. This is something that comes up a lot in math. Translating a problem into a different space that's easier to work in, and then translating back at the end. The hard part is usually noticing that there's an equivalent problem to begin with where the solution might be easier. So the first question we're going to ask is, what is the contribution of a small piece of the mass shell, say at the point Q, to the total acceleration at point P? That much seems sensible since if we can figure it out for one piece, we have hope of adding up all the little contributions and getting the cumulative effect of the entire shell. Now, the not obviously relevant question we're going to ask is, what is the average acceleration of all the points a distance r from the center caused by q? This set of points is an imaginary spherical shell that we can call the observation surface. But okay, one thing at a time. What's the acceleration at p due to the little mass at q? Newton's universal law of gravitation gives us the answer. We already figured out earlier though, that for the whole mass shell, the acceleration is purely radial. So let's only worry about the radial component from now on. To get it, we just need to multiply by the cosine of this angle. Different points P have their own G radial depending on their distance D and angle theta. Here, I'll just show you a few more of them. You can see how the acceleration is larger near Q, which is what we expect. So now, what is the average of this radial acceleration over the observation surface? Well, this is the total g radial over the sphere, divided by the area of the sphere. We usually write averages like this using angle brackets. Using the samples I've drawn, you can think of this as lining up all the vectors and figuring out their average height. Of course, in reality, there are infinitely many, but no worries, the average exists just the same. To actually compute it, we can think of the observation surface as being made up of a bunch of little area elements, one for each radial acceleration vector. Let's check one out. This is an edge-on view, but remember, we're talking about a little area on the surface of a sphere. The contribution of this piece to the total will be g radial times this little area. This is important, and we're going to find a nice way to write it by relating it to what's happening at Q. To do that though, I need to introduce one other concept here that you might not be too familiar with, but hopefully you'll see the motivation. It's to do with solid angles, and the idea is that, much like we can convert angles into arc lengths on a circle using the radius, we can convert solid, that is, 2D angles, into areas on a sphere. In this case, we have two factors of the radius because these are now two-dimensional quantities. It'll be important later too that the total solid angle of a sphere is 4 pi, in units called steradians, analogous to how going all the way around a circle gives you 2 pi radians. Back to our problem, we can now relate the area A to the solid angle that it takes up as seen from Q. Let's zoom in on Q2 over at the other end of this line, so we can see what's happening better. Think of the thin cone with Q at its vertex extending out toward the observation surface and just intersecting it through the area A. Like the way G and G radial were connected by cosine of this angle, so too are A and what I've called A prime. A prime is how A looks from Q's perspective, a bit smaller because it's tilted by the angle theta but a prime is just the solid angle of the cone multiplied by the distance to q squared. You can maybe see where this is headed. Combining these equations gives us an expression for a in terms of the solid angle omega. 
And remember, we wanted G radial times this area so that we can add up the product over the whole observation surface. Multiplying this out looks messy at first. But then the magic happens. The distance and the angle cancel out, which are exactly the quantities that characterize different points on the observation surface. Meaning, this product is independent of P. It's true for all points on the observation surface. For the same opening angle omega of a little cone coming from Q, G radial times A where it crosses the sphere is just a constant. Now we're in business. To sum the product over the sphere, we just turn our little solid angle into the whole solid angle of a sphere, 4 pi. And to get the average, we just divide by the area of the sphere. Cancel the 4 pi's and we have our answer. Notice a few cool things happening here. If we had chosen a different point on the mass shell, we would have gotten exactly the same set of radial acceleration vectors just all rotated. Not only that, it's the same expression as if we had put the mass point at the center. In fact, I hope it's clear now that it doesn't even matter where we put Q, as long as it's inside the observation surface. The specific set of G radial vectors changes, but the average stays the same. And if that's the case, we can treat every point on our original mass shell the same way, and put them all at the center. All right, we're on the home stretch. We just need to connect this back to our original problem. Since every point on the observation shell is equivalent and experiences the same purely radial acceleration, the value there is just equal to the average. This is like asking what the average of a set of numbers is, which are all the same. The average is just any one member of the set. Meaning, finally, we can remove the averaging brackets, and we're done. Let's just multiply again by your mass to bring us back to the force we started with. So whether it's a point of mass, a shell of mass, or a bunch of shells stuck together looking like a planet, or a star, or whatever spherically symmetric thing, whether you're floating out in space or even standing on the surface, if you want to know how gravity is pulling on you, just remember nature's beautiful conspiracy, simplifying your calculations through symmetry. Thanks for watching.